Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Another week and another day on which we have to talk about something really, really important. Coming off of the unfortunate loss of Antoine Hubert at Spa last week, this week at Monza, we have another very scary accident. This one in a Formula 3 race involving Alex Peroni. Peroni was driving in the F3 race, coming through Parabolica. He goes off the circuit to the left there where there is paved run out. He goes over one of the FIA Jean Tot sausage curbs, and he gets launched dozens of feet into the air, landing on top of a barrier cockpit side first. Thankfully, Peroni was perfectly okay, as far as all of the initial reports have said. It appears that the barrier did its job in terms of absorbing energy, and most importantly, it appears that Halo did its job in protecting a driver in a rollover situation. So all of these are very good things, and of course, especially coming out of the last week and losing a driver and having another driver, Juan Manuel Correa, very seriously injured, it's very good to see that we have a driver walk away from what was a very scary incident. However, there has come about the development of all sorts of backslapping and high-fiving and mutual admiration and adoration on the part of the FIA and their stakeholders looking at this Peroni accident and saying, well, look how safe the cars are. The guy walked out of this. This is absolutely great. This is a very serious problem. And we're going to talk about why. If you happen to be of a weaker disposition, if you are easily offended, or if facts make you uncomfortable, you should probably not watch any further. I think to best illustrate my point here, the only thing I can think to do is to tell you a story. And it's not at all motorsport related, but it is engineering related, and it is groupthink related. And I think it serves to highlight the level of problems that we have in the FIA with regard not only to safety, but uh, with regard to all kinds of other aspects of how the sport is running and how we operate the race weekends, how we homologate spec parts for safety, how we homologate spec chassis in lower series, basically every aspect of the sport from the on-track action to the bureaucratic action from the FIA in terms of governing all of this and operating all of this. I think a lot of people lose sight of how big an organization the FIA is. This is an international non-governmental organization and my political science background is showing here. For those of you who don't know, and a non-governmental organization, or NGO. It's an organization that is very big, and it serves either a governmental role as in running large organizations by itself, or it serves in an advisory capacity. And the FIA sort of does both of these things to different degrees. Other NGOs in the world include things like the Red Cross, for example. What they do is they coordinate with medical staff, doctors, nurses, suppliers, transporters, all kinds of things to distribute medical care to people in places where it's needed. And they're based, I believe they're based in Switzerland, and they serve the entire planet. They go out on humanitarian missions all the time and take care of people. They go into disaster zones and they distribute medical care and survival supplies, uh, food, water, whatever. And they're very effective at what they do. They see a need, and they have the resources to supply that need. And the FIA, in some regards, is very similar to the Red Cross in that regard. The FIA, its initials in French translated to English mean the International Motorsport or the International Automotive Federation. The FIA basically came into existence in the early 20th century, and much like the AAA did in the United States, it initially uh, came out to be an, advo an advocacy group for motoring uh, public, basically. Motor cars, automobiles, were a new idea back then, and a lot of people were just starting to have access to them, and people didn't know how to drive. There were no rules for roads. There were no rules for manufacturers in terms of trying to figure out how a car should be built. What sorts of engines should they have? What sorts of fuel should they run on? Should they have closed cabins? Things like that. Uh, how, do we, how do we come up with speed limits? How do we mark speed limits or directional signs and things on the road? So organizations like the AAA in North America and the FIA in Europe came about to try and push governments 
to standardize these things, to come up with regulations to make travel easier, to make automobiles more accessible, safer, easier to operate, and to educate the general public in terms of what cars were, how they should be used, what the potential dangers of them are. Basically, how do we keep each other safe as we're all out here ut utilizing this common resource of roads? So that's how organizations like the FIA come to exist. And they have very noble roots when it comes down to their founding stories and how, and how they came to be and ultimately why they exist. They serve a very good purpose. They serve in terms of public information, ad advocacy, all kinds of things, and of course lobbying governments in order to get rules passed to keep people safe and to keep things as level as possible when it comes to utilizing commonly owned resources like roadways in this regard. So very generally, that's how the FIA came to be and that is what it is at its core. After World War II, Particularly in Europe, things were an absolute mess. Whole countries were totally destroyed, and they had to be rebuilt in many cases literally from the ground up, particularly when we, when we talk about places like Germany or the Netherlands or Belgium or parts of France and even parts of Britain were completely annihilated during the war. At the same time, motor racing was also basically annihilated during the war. The pre-war Grand Prix days, you had your big players, the Germans, the Brits, the French, the Italians, all big stars, names like Nobilari and Kling and guys like those who were your pre-war Grand Prix stars and manufacturers like Mercedes and Auto Union, now Audi. Of course, you had your, your Maseratis and Alfa Romeos of the world, your Renault and Citroën and all of these companies. Of course, the Brits players in that as well. World War II brought all of that to a grinding halt, obviously. And many of the, the manufacturers and team managers and drivers who would have been participating in the pre-war Grand Prix went out to fight in the war. And those who survived came back and said, hey, I'd rather like to go motor racing again. So immediately post-war, 1947, we start to see the beginnings of Formula One start to become formalized. And in 1950, we had the launch of the FIA Formula One World Championship. The FIA took it upon itself to become the governing body for international motoring competition. And this is a role that they've held ever since, basically, the late 1940s in the immediate post-war era. Since then, the FIA has grown to be an organization that has a presence in every major country on Earth. They obviously have influence still with local governments, both uh, national level as well as even municipal or hyper-local level in terms of influencing regulations in terms of road safety, vehicle manufacturer, things like that. However, the FIA, in so doing, has necessarily grown exponentially. It is now a huge organization. There are tens of thousands of people who either directly or indirectly work for the FIA. And when you have an organization that has a presence in over a hundred countries around the world, and when you have an organization that's running shows as big as the Formula One World Championship, and then of course the feeder series to that, talking about Formula Two, Formula Three, the national level Formula 4 championship, some of those are directly sanctioned by the FIA. The FIA also has a role played in IMSA competition here in the United States. They don't have a direct sanctioning role in the United States in most series, but they have an observer role in IndyCar, IMSA, as we mentioned. Even going down into very low-level grassroots series, you have FIA homologated regulations that have to be enforced and observed by regional race clubs. Even racing schools have to comply with certain FIA standards when it comes to equipment, marshalling, things like that. So they're huge, and their scope is huge, and their amount of paperwork is huge in terms of how they have to deal with all of this and figure out how do we proceed. Dealing with the Formula One World Championship alone is enormous. That series literally spans the world on a yearly basis. We have 21 races in 2019. We're visiting five continents. It's colossal. It's absolutely colossal. And any organization that's going to be running something that big, with that wide a scope, with such huge logistical challenges, needs to be well organized, and it needs to be big. However... When we do have large organizations, be they governments or non-governmental organizations like the FIA in this instance, 
you start to run into problems of organization and personnel management, not necessarily in terms of who the people are, what their roles are, and, and how they how they execute their day-to-day -day functions, but you start to have problems in terms of how people communicate with one another in the process of doing their jobs. And there's a story that really speaks to me with regard to a situation like this, which I'll call groupthink here. It's a technical term in psychology and political science, and you can look it up if you're so inclined. But basically, groupthink means that when you have a result that is mutually desired by all stakeholders in any sort of organization, when there is some eventuality that everybody wants to achieve, the person or persons who come up with the path of least resistance to meeting that objective will ultimately become the most influential part of the group. And anybody else who has any doubts or dissenting opinion about it is ultimately going to be sidelined in favor of whatever this path of least resistance is. And the story that, to me, very effectively illustrates some of the potential dangers of groupthink is the story of the 1986 loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Space Shuttle Challenger, for those of you who don't know, was an American spacecraft. It was a space shuttle that uh, first flew in 1982, and uh, it flew 10 missions, including the uh, flight on which it was lost. And it was a member of the American Space Shuttle fleet. It was the second orbiter to fly after Columbia. And uh, after its first flight, it became the workhorse of the shuttle program. Of course, uh, following the introduction of Challenger, we would have the orbiters Atlantis and Discovery join the fleet. But for a while, it was just two space shuttle orbiters, Columbia and Challenger, flying all of NASA's manned space missions. During the 1980s, we had a huge cultural and technological revolution in the United States, but really around the world. We were starting to miniaturize electronic components. Personal computers became accessible to many people for the first time ever. The beginnings of the Internet were starting to come about. And in keeping with all of this, President Reagan at the time, as well as the managers of NASA came up with an objective that the United States should have routine and reliable and reasonably low cost access to low Earth orbit in terms of space flight. So this came about to to cause a very tight schedule in the flight manifest of the space shuttle program. Columbia made its first flight in 1981 on April the 12th. John Young and Bob Crippen launched on that test flight. They came back totally successful. And then by 1986, we had already flown 24 space shuttle missions up to the point of Challenger's last launch. The shuttle program was proceeding very successfully, already some hang-ups in terms of being able to get the vehicles turned around and back into orbit as soon as possible, because it's a very complicated machine after all. But all in all, the program was beginning to achieve its objectives. And this is what the country wanted, it's what the White House wanted, and it's certainly what NASA wanted. However, coming up to the launch of Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986, two very important things happened. One was the initiation of the Teacher in Space program. That was started by the Vice President's office. The Vice President at the time was George Bush. And the Vice President has a ceremonial role as being the head director of the American Space Program, among other things. So there was a national competition to name a teacher to serve as an astronaut on a space shuttle mission in the mid-80s. And after this competition, ultimately a teacher named Krista McAuliffe from Connecticut won the competition, and she was selected to fly on an upcoming shuttle mission, which turned out to be the flight of Challenger in January 1986, STS-51L. So this started a lot of good press for NASA, for the space program, and generally for the United States. Uh, People, believe it or not, started to become jaded with the idea of space flight. It became routine. It became something that was expected rather than something that was the exception to the rule. So national interest was waning, and we needed something to drum up more public engagement. So the teacher in space program was that. Krista McAuliffe selected for the mission. We have a launch date set for late 1985. Challengers prepared for launch. Everything is set. Due to a number of technical setbacks, weather constraints, things of this nature, even just some planning problems, Challenger's mission gets, gets pushed back from 1985 to the beginning of 1986. Many, many delays are leading up to this flight. 
On the morning of launch, there were even more problems which cropped up. Now, the space shuttle flew from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Florida is a generally very warm and sunny, bright, fun place to be. Good weather most of the time, the occasional hurricane, but for the most part, very good weather conditions for launching a spacecraft. Well, the night of January 27th into January 28th, well, things were a little bit different. Rather uncharacteristically for central Florida on the east coast there, the weather at night dropped into the 30s Fahrenheit. In fact, it dropped below 32 Fahrenheit, which meant that water can freeze. Therefore, when management got to the launch pad on the morning of January 28th, they were greeted by sheets of ice, huge walls of icicles, and just generally nothing looks good for launching today. However, remember we have got ourselves that big story and everybody wants to see this flight go off. Everybody wants to see Krista McAuliffe give lessons from space. And everybody wants to see the space program get restarted and we want to reap the rewards of having this, this huge PR thing. Okay, So NASA decides to press ahead with the launch. At the same time, engineers from a company called Morton Thiokol at the time... They were the contractors that built the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle. And those of you who have seen my review of the space shuttle Endeavour model, you've seen what a solid rocket booster looks like. Those were the main engines that gave the vehicle most of the thrust at liftoff, and they were absolutely critical to getting a successful launch. The Thiokol engineers knew that at temperatures below 59 degrees Fahrenheit, so in other words, it's in the mid-30s right now, but... The engineers at Thiokol are saying that any temperature below 59 degrees presents a problem to the solid rocket boosters performing normally. In other words, the seals in the booster casings, the seals that actually contain the very hot and very high pressure combustion gases and direct them downward out the base of the nozzle to provide the upward thrust needed for liftoff, those seals might not perform normally at temperatures below 59 degrees. And Thiokol management and Thiokol engineers call up NASA a couple hours before the planned launch time, and they say, look, we are pretty confident that our, our hardware is not going to perform well today. NASA management says, well, can you prove it? And Thiokol says, no, we can't prove it, but we know, based on data from previous flights in cooler temperatures, that we had problems with the O-ring seals in the solid rocket boosters. We advise you not to fly today. NASA then comes back, and they convene amongst themselves in their own upper-level management, and they weigh the risk factors. They say, okay, the guys who built these solid rocket boosters say that it's probably too cold to fly today. However... We've flown missions in 50-degree weather before. They're saying that 59 degrees, uh, they can't guarantee that the O-ring seals are going to work properly. But we've flown these missions 24 times. We have a lot of experience now flying these boosters, and we've flown them in 50-degree weather before, and we didn't have any problems. So what are the odds? What are the odds that we're going to have anything abnormal today? It's never happened before. These guys are just being way too cautious here. We know that everything's ready to go today, and the chances of there being a really huge problem are just so small that they're, we can basically just disregard them. So ultimately, that was the decision that NASA made. The crew climbs aboard, Challenger lifts off, and then everybody breathes a collective sigh of relief when the solid rocket boosters ignite because... The Thiokol engineers, in their warnings to NASA, had said that if you light those boosters in 36-degree air temperature, the vehicle's going to blow up on the launch pad. The countdown clock reached T0, the boosters were ignited, and Challenger cleared the tower. And everybody said, well, we dodged that bullet. Guess everything's fine now. What they didn't know was that as soon as those solid rocket boosters ignited, the two O-ring seals, the only two O-ring seals on the aft field joint of the right-hand solid rocket booster had been incinerated. And they didn't know that there was smoke pouring out from where those O-ring seals used to be. And that the only thing keeping the solid rocket booster together was a little bit of unburned propellant.
that formed a slag and plugged the hole. 60 seconds go by. Challenger is exceeding the speed of sound now and heading through the most stressful phase of its launch. Hits an unexpected gust of wind passing through an upper level jet stream. That little bit of slag got broken loose from the right hand booster. A blowtorch like flame started to blow out of the side of that solid rocket booster joint and it started to punch a hole into the side of the external fuel tank in the bottom of the liquid hydrogen tank. Hydrogen is the most volatile element that we know of. And that started to leak. 13 seconds later, the crew of Challenger was dead. And everybody knew exactly why. I tell you this story not because I want to bore you about things that are not related to motorsport or things that are just relatively obscure amounts of useless knowledge in terms of history. I tell you this story because those astronauts died because of something that was entirely preventable, because of something that was entirely known, and because of something that was even warned against on the day of their deaths. And that something was willfully ignored. NASA chose to roll the dice. And it came up snake ice, unfortunately for those seven souls. The correlation that this has with the sausage curb situation in the FIA today, it's striking. The correlations that it even has with the death of Jules Bianchi is pretty striking, if we want to go into that. At the 2018 Macau Grand Prix, we saw the very dramatic accident involving Sophia Flersch in that race. She got well out of shape, making contact with another car at the end of the a very fast straight on that course. Her car came across the back of a sausage curb backwards, completely out of control, missing wheels already. Nothing she could have done to slow down or steer away. And the car is launched into the air, completely over top of the barriers, and it crashes into a temporary photographer's stand, which was a rather substantial structure. Corrugated steel facade and, I assume, some truss frame interior structure giving it its strength. Sophia was injured in the accident. She has since made a return to racing. She does not appear to have any lasting illnesses from her injuries. However, that incident really highlighted the dangers of these sausage curbs, which are there simply to discourage corner cutting. Of course, we want to make sure that racing drivers are playing by the rules as much as is feasi feasibly possible, so we put in these deterrents to keep them on the racing line and to keep them within the bounds of the race track, between the two white lines, as it were. However, after seeing a car, through no fault of its own, get launched dozens of feet into the air and then crash into a building, a temporary one, but a building nonetheless on the side of the circuit, that was the wake-up call that everybody needed to say, you know what, these sausage curbs, they work for their intended purpose, but they also have some unintended consequences, and we need to deal with that. And I remember at the time there was some outcry about the sausage curb saying this should not happen. This driver, through no fault of her own, ended up crashing into a building. So what are we going to do about it? Jean Tot, enter the chat, please. Jean Tot decides to do nothing. And then we don't hear about it ever again. Until today at Monza, when Alex Peroni gets launched at least 20 feet into the air and then lands on top of a tire barrier cockpit side first. Now, everybody out there, including Will Buxton, who seems to be the official propaganda spokesperson for Formula One at very least, if not the FIA in total, is out there on Twitter right now talking about how happy everybody should be that Halo did its job. And we should be happy that Halo did its job. We just, as we mentioned off the top, came out of a weekend where we had one driver die and another driver is still in intensive care in a medically induced coma. Anything that's better than that is a happy ending as far as we're concerned. However, to sing the praises of Halo and to forget the elephant in the room is dangerous and it's a logical fallacy. It's pretty clear, looking at the video, 
that Peroni's car stays on the ground if there's no sausage curb on the outside of Parabolica. And in all fairness, the FIA did order the sausage curbs removed from that portion of the circuit immediately after the Formula 3 race concluded and before Formula 1 qualifying got underway. So that was a smart decision. But if there's no sausage curb, Peroni doesn't get airborne. If Peroni doesn't get airborne, there's no accident. So we can say good things about Halo all we want, and undoubtedly it most likely saved Peroni's life today. However, just the fact that we got into a situation where Halo was needed is a problem. Again, just like the Challenger disaster, this was a situation that could be avoided. It was a situation that was known about, and in the form of Sophia Flourish's accident in 2018 at Macau, it was a situation that we saw before, and we saw that it could have absolutely terrifying consequences. And just like Challenger, the decision to do something about it was never made. And, he, and here we are. Thankfully, we have a driver walking away from this. But a couple more feet vertically, Peroni doesn't land on top of a tire barrier. He lands on top of a catch fence, a steel mesh catch fence, well small enough to get past Halo and right into his helmet, assuming that he lands cockpit side first. If the car rolls a little bit more in the air, he skirts over top of the catch fence and then lands on unprotected grass on the outside of the circuit near where the old banking is. That's just unprotected concrete, which is in deteriorating condition. Who knows how it would react to a race car landing on top of it at high speed. So, today we got extremely lucky. But today, I think everybody should be very scared because... Once again, we see unintended consequences occurring. These sausage curbs have been a problem for a long time. We, we've seen curbing brake race cars before. I remember watching, I think it was the 2007 or 2008 Malaysian Grand Prix, David Coulthard in practice going over the back of a curb and the front suspension completely collapsed just from touching a curb from the wrong angle. That shouldn't happen either, but nothing's been done about that, and the sausage curbs only make that problem worse. So I don't know what to tell all of you. I don't know what to tell the FIA other than get rid of the sausage curbs permanently. Don't rest on your laurels. Don't go out there and say that Halo is the greatest thing in the world and then neglect the other problems that you have. Everybody knows the truth. Everybody knows that Halo is only there because of the accident that took Jules Bianchi from us. And everybody also knows that Halo would have done nothing to save Jules Bianchi. The real problem on that day in Suzuka was not even the tractor on the track. The real problem was the race director. Yes, Mr. Charlie Whiting. The real problem was the race director not throwing the red flag when conditions became that terrible. The real problem was Jules Bianchi not slowing down enough. And the real problem was the FIA's complete deflection of responsibility in that incident. The FIA doesn't control what corner marshals do and they know it, and we all know it. That's why there is a tractor in the gravel trap there, and that's why the cars were still under racing conditions. Halo's a stopgap. It is not the end-all, be-all. It is not the ultimate solution to driver safety, and it's not something that should be celebrated today. Yes, it most likely saved Alex Peroni's life, but it only saved his life because it was put in a situation it was never designed for. Thankfully, it was adequate. As we saw last week at Spa, there are still plenty of weak spots in race cars. Halo or no Halo. So, in all, I suppose what I'm serving to do with this video is just to give you a cautionary tale. Be vigilant. Be very critical of everything that you see. Do a little bit of research into history as well. Because most problems that we see, be it in motorsport or in real life, we've encountered them before in some form. That's the purpose of me telling you about the Space Shuttle Challenger. It's the same thing with the FIA today in 2019. And I don't know about you, but it's high time somebody does something about it. Because more guys are going to die because of half-banked safety measures and 
corner cutting compliance measures like these sausage curbs. Until next time, I thank you all for listening. Ferrari Mount 601 saying thanks, and of course, we will see you soon.